Hi everyone, welcome to SBS 304 Research Methods. Today we're going to be talking about reliability and validity of measures. This is different from reliability and validity of studies, which we'll talk about later in the semester. Before we do that, I want to take some time to address your questions. The main questions that y'all expressed this time were about levels of measurement and operationalization. So going from some specific questions on the discussion boards, we're going to talk about levels of measurement, including nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio, and how they relate. So you can think of level of measurement as the hierarchy of specificity of measures. So basically, how specific is a measure? How precise is a measure? Uh, and you can think of it hierarchically. So kind of the lowest level of measurement, the most basic level of measurement is nominal. Um, nominal measures are a type of categorical measure, uh, which basically the values that such a measure can take are just names of categories that cannot be meaningfully ordered. Uh, I think the example I gave last time was nationality. You can't say that German is more nationality than Australian. Um, they're both nationalities. They can't be meaningfully ordered. Now we can order them in arbitrary ways, like we can order them alphabetically, for example, and Australian would come before German. But that doesn't mean that it's higher on the scale of nationality for some reason, right? Um, another example of a categorical variable would be religion. Um, asking what religion a person is, the values that it could take are, uh, there are many of them, but they're finite. They're a list of, of values that religion can take. Uh, such as Christian, Buddhist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, uh, Jain, native religions, etc. Um, but all of them are equally religions. That is, we may have personal opinions about which one is correct, but that doesn't mean that one is more religion than another. They're all equally religions. Um, a much simpler idea... Um, example of a categorical variable would be like flavors of ice cream. You may like one more than another, but they're all equally flavors of ice cream, whether they be chocolate or vanilla or strawberry or butter pecan. Uh, they're all flavors of ice cream in the same way. We can't meaningfully order them. The next level of measurement is ordinal, which is the same idea um, as nominal, except that categories can be meaningfully ordered. So an example here could be level of education, uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, some college but no degree, college degree, graduate degree. Um, these are categories of education. They're finite in number um, and they're just categories, but we can order them. We know that high school education is more education than elementary school and graduate school is more education than high school. What we can't do is say that the distance between those categories is the same. So we can't say that people spend you know eight years in elementary and middle school. They spend four years in high school. They spend four years in college but they could spend two years in college to get an associate's degree. Or they could spend three years because they graduated early. Or they could spend eight years to get a bachelor's degree. Um, we can't say that the, there's a, a measurable equal distance between each category. Uh, that's what an interval variable is. It's the next level up from ordinal. Not only can categories be ordered, they are ordered in a way that the distance between each category is the same. So an, inter an example of interval measures would be, um, would be years of education. Years of education is uh, an interval measure because not only can the categories be ordered, 
but the distance between them is equal. So if I were to say years of education, have you had six years of education? Have you had seven years, eight years, nine years, 10 years? The, the intervals between six years and seven years is the same as the interval between 11 years and 12 years. No matter where you go on the scale, they're equal distances apart. Um, now the thing about an interval measure, oh, I actually need a different interval measure. Going up from ordinal, the next level is interval. An interval measure is one where the values are infinite, the possible values are infinite, the distance between categories are the same, and there is no true meaningful zero. So an example of an interval measure would be temperature on the Fahrenheit scale. Temperature on the Fahrenheit scale is an, it's not just categories that can be ordered, like an ordinal variable. The numbers, the, the distance between each number on the scale is equal. So for example, the difference between 30 degrees Fahrenheit and 31 degrees Fahrenheit is the same as the distance between 31 and 32. That's really all an interval measure is. It's an ordinal measure with equal distances between categories. So we can't say that uh, level of education is interval because the distance between categories isn't the same. But we can say that uh, degrees on the Fahrenheit temperature scale is interval because the degrees are equal distances apart. And that's really all an interval measure means. Now, as with temperature on the Fahrenheit scale, interval measures don't have true meaningful zeros. Zero degrees Fahrenheit does not mean that there's no temperature. Zero degrees Fahrenheit just means that it's really cold. But it doesn't mean an absence of heat. That would be zero degrees Kelvin, which is theoretically possible, but isn't typically what we measure with degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the scale is kind of zeroed out at an arbitrary point. Uh, proof of that is that we can have negative degrees Fahrenheit. If you can have negative numbers on a scale, then it's probably interval and not ratio. Uh, but theoretically, there are infinite values that degrees Fahrenheit could take. We could theoretically go to negative any number of degrees Fahrenheit and positive any number of degrees Fahrenheit. Um, ratio measures are another kind of continuous measure, meaning they're measured on a scale and can take on infinite different values. But with a ratio measure, not only are categories ordered and equal distances apart, there's also a true meaningful zero. So an example of a ratio measure would be years of age. If you are zero years old, you have a complete absence of age. Now, people reckon age differently. Um, in some cultures, children are assessed to be one year old when they're born. Uh, but in the way we think of it in the United States most of the time, uh, age is a ratio measure. Before you're born, you have zero days in age. You are zero years old. Um, even when you're six months, you're some number of years old. It's a fractional number, but it's not zero. Zero is the true absence of the thing being measured. So another example of a ratio measure could be drinks of alcohol. How much alcohol do you drink in a week? Um, if you tell me you have zero drinks and I believe you, it means that you literally have no alcohol drinks in a week. Uh, zero is a true and meaningful number. You could theoretically have infinite number of drinks, and the difference between one drinks and two drinks is the same as the difference between 10 drinks and 11 drinks. Intervals are equal, and there's a meaningful zero. So when I say what's the level of measurement, 
I'm asking whether the measure is nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. Um, this tells us what we can do with the variables. So it isn't going to be a particularly useful concept this semester, but when you're in statistics, understanding the level of measurement of each variable is critical because it determines what you can know about the variable. If you think that, an, that a measure is ratio when it's in fact interval, then you might try to do tests with it that don't make any sense. And you might get really confused. So understanding level of measurement is vitally important for your life moving forward, even if we won't really apply it much this semester. Now, when we do surveys, we will apply it to some degree. Uh, probably we'll only deal with nominal and ordinal variables because we're not going to be doing any complicated statistics. Um, beyond just kind of counts and rates and proportions. Uh, so this is kind of knowledge you need to have and keep in mind. The next question, oh, here's an example or a table kind of explaining everything I just said. Um, the next question y'all seem to have trouble with was with the idea of operationalization. Uh, so remember, operationalization is how we go from a concept to a variable with multiple indicators. So a concept is kind of the squishy underlying idea that we want to know about. Uh, and the dimension is a part of that concept, one element of that concept. Uh, a variable is a measure of a dimension and an indicator is a value of a variable. So the concept is the big idea, what you want to know about. Here I've used the example of happiness. The dimension is the aspect of the concept you want to measure. Uh, subjective well-being, how well do you think you're doing in general, is what we mean by subjective well-being. Um, the variable is how you will measure the dimension you want to assess. So. The question we might ask to measure subjective well-being is how well do you feel your life is going most of the time? And an indicator is the concrete value the variable can take. So in this case, we have an ordinal variable. Uh, we have categories that can be arranged in a meaningful order from not at all well, not very well, not well but not badly, fairly well, or very well. These are the values that our variable, how well do you feel your life is going most of the time, can take. And that variable is used to assess the dimension subjective well-being, which is part of the concept of what we mean by happiness. So the concept is happiness, and we've moved all the way down to answers someone could give to how well they feel their life is going most of the time. That's what we mean when we say a variable is operationalized. So today we're going to talk about reliability and validity. Reliability and validity here refer to measures. We can talk later in the semester about the reliability and validity of studies, but today we're going to talk about measures or variables being reliable or valid. So reliability and variables are used to assess research. Um, and what we mean by this, reliability means, are our measures consistent? Are our measures predictable? Are our measures dependable? When we talk about validity, we're asking, are we actually measuring what we intend to measure? These are related, but not identical concepts. For example, a measure can be reliable, but not valid and a, valid can, or a measure can be valid but not reliable. Um, a valid measure of happiness would be, how are you feeling? Um, but we could ask, how are you feeling, multiple different ways. So if I said, how are you today? How do you feel today? How is your life going today? Those could all be valid measures of happiness. But if I ask each person a slightly different question, that measure is not very reliable. Um, 
Similarly, a measure could be reliable but not valid. It could be very predictable and consistent, but not get at what we intend at all. An example of this would be using a bathroom scale to measure height. If someone gets on a bathroom scale, um, it will tell us how much they weigh. As long as the scale is properly set up and calibrated, it will measure everyone's weight accurately, and it will measure everyone's weight on the same kind of scale, um, but it won't tell us anything about their height. Weight and height may be t correlated to some degree, but you can be short and heavier, or you can be tall and a lot lighter. So weight is a reliable measure, but it's an invalid measure of height. Um, so there are several dimensions of reliability and validity that we're going to talk about today. First, we're going to talk about reliability, uh, which is the question, are our measures consistent? Mostly when we talk about validity, or mostly when we talk about reliability, we're talking about composite measures. So the reason we would use a composite measure is because we want to average multiple measures of the same idea together. Um, we'll talk more about why this is a good idea in a minute. Um, but basically, for example, you could see the Center for Epidemiologic Studies depression scale that's represented in figure 5.2 in your textbook. Um, if we want to measure a big underlying concept with lots of dimensions, it might not do to just ask one question. Um, we could miss what we're trying to measure if we only ask one question. So let's say I want to know if you're depressed, and I just ask, hey, are you depressed? That would be a single item measure. Are you depressed? Well, you may not think of yourself as depressed, but you might have a lot of symptoms of depression, and an outside observer would say, yes, you are depressed. Reasons you might not say you're depressed. Maybe you don't recognize all your symptoms because you're not paying attention to them. Maybe you don't know that some of the things you're experiencing are considered symptoms of depression. Maybe you don't believe depression exists for spiritual or cultural reasons. Maybe you have really different understandings of what it means to be depressed. Um, maybe you think that in order to be depressed, you have to be so sad that you want to die, when in fact we would consider you depressed as researchers at a much lower level of sadness. So if you want to know if someone's depressed, rather than just using a single item measure, it makes sense to apply a scale where we ask lots of different questions that get at the idea of being depressed instead of just directly asking. So on the scale are questions like, um, in the past week, have you felt sad or blue? In the past week, have you felt like everything was an effort? In the past week, have you felt that people were unfriendly? In the past week, have you felt pushed around by life? In the past week, have you felt tired and run down? These are all kinds of things that get at the idea of depression. And none of them get at depression perfectly. But if we average people's scores on those items together, we get a pretty good picture of how depressed a person is on average. Um, so the internal reliability of a composite variable is how well each item measures the same underlying concept. So how well does each item on the CES depression scale measure depression? Um, this is the concept of internal reliability. Is the scale reliable in that it reliably measures depression? Uh, it can be assessed using a statistic that you'll learn about next year called Cronbach's Alpha, or next semester called Cronbach's Alpha. Cronbach's Alpha is literally a statistic for a scale that tells us how well the scale holds together 
uh, and thus how well it measures the same concept. If every item on the scale is highly correlated with each other, then we assume it's measuring the same concept. Um, now, is that concept really what we intend to measure? I could have a scale with a very high Kronbach's alpha that doesn't actually measure what I think it measures. What I mean is, if I measure, if I used the CESD, what I mean is, if I used the Center for Epidemiologic Studies anxiety scale, I would find that it has a very high Kronbach's alpha, but if I used it to measure depression, that wouldn't be correct. I would still get a high reliability measure because it's a scale with every item measuring the same concept, but that concept is not depression. So ways we can assess reliability also include intercoder reliability. Uh, intercoder reliability is the degree to which different coders, human observers, agree when looking at the same thing. This is usually not related to composite measures. So thinking back, internal reliability re refers to composite variables or composite measures. Intercoder reliability doesn't have to. It can apply to any kind of measure. So what it means is the degree to which different observers agree when looking at the same thing. So an example of that is a very problematic kind of study that's frequently done uh, on child attractiveness. Now, this is problematic because child attractiveness is very subjective. Uh, a lot of people rate children more attractive or less attractive depending on their race. A lot of people rate children more attractive or less attractive depending on their class, uh, so how wealthy or poor the child appears. And other people consider children more or less attractive depending on whether they have a disability. So if you know a child is deaf, you might rate them as less attractive, even though that doesn't affect their physical appearance. However, what we know about studies of attractiveness is that they highly correlate with things like how much teachers like the children. Uh, teachers show strong, consistent preferences for cuter children. Uh, this is unfortunate, but simply true. Um, more attractive children are also more likely to have more friends and are also more likely to have better grades. A lot hinges on children's perceived attractiveness. So we have an interest in understanding how attractiveness may affect children's lives and their outcomes, uh, but how do you determine how attractive a child is? What I think is cute, you might not think is cute at all. Um, I think dimples don't make a child more or less attractive, but a lot of people really love dimples on little kids. They just think they're the cutest thing. Um, I, um, a lot of people found my little brother extremely cute because he had big brown eyes with long, dark eyelashes and people were like, oh, he looks like a little doll. And I was like, yeah, okay. He looks like a little doll, but dolls are kind of creepy. Uh, so cuteness is very subjective. Some people love freckles, some people not so much. So how do you determine how cute a child is? Well, one way to do it is to have a panel of coders, that is human observers, look at images of the same child and rate their attractiveness or cuteness on a scale. So on a scale of one to five, with one being not at all cute and five being extremely cute, how cute is this kid? Uh, which is a weird question to ask, but one we might need to ask. Um, so kind of the gold standard for intercoder reliability is achieved if coders agree about 80% of the time. So when we think of intercoder reliability, we basically want eight out of 10 observers to assign the same child the same score on the scale. So if a child is a three, eight times out of 10, we can say that that's a really reliable measure of attractiveness. 
So precision and robustness are ways of designing studies to be more reliable or designing measures to be more reliable. So when we have a precise conceptualization of exactly what we're trying to measure, it's a lot easier to measure it properly. So when we think of child attractiveness, if we conceptualize that in a precise way, how cute does this child look? Well, a lot of things can determine how cute a child looks, right? Putting the child in a cuter outfit can determine how cute they look. Uh, styling a child's hair differently can determine how cute they look. Uh, putting makeup on a child could make them look cuter in theory. Um, so precisely conceiving of how the kid looks, um, or of what we mean by the concept cute, uh, can really help. So we might want to say something like, on a scale of one to five, how pleasant do you find this child's facial features? Or on a scale of one to five, um, how much do you think this child has a naturally attractive appearance? Um, we could conceptualize it in a number of ways, but the more precise we are in our meaning, the easier it is to get a reliable measure. Another way we can design for reliability, make sure our measures are reliable, uh, is to test for robustness. Robustness is simply how well a measure works. It relates to reliability because reliable measures, in theory, work better. Um, so this relates to uh, composite, but also simple or single item measures. Um, so one test of robustness we can do with composite measures is called the split half method. This is when uh, we cut a composite measure in half and test each half with the same group of individuals. So for example, I would take the Center for Epidemiologic Studies depression scale in five, figure 5.2 in your book, which is 20 items, and I would cut it in half. I would cut it into two separate scales with 10 items each, and I would give each half scale, each split in half scale, to the same sample of individuals. And I would see whether their scores on both were similar. Um, if they're very similar, then we can say that each half of the scale is measuring the same concept reliably. Um, another thing we could do is the test-retest method. So a measure might be unreliable if the same individual could score differently depending on the day. So, uh, for example, with the concept of child attractiveness, um, if people find the same child cute on one day and less cute on another day, we're probably using a really lousy measure of cuteness. Um, so a way we could assess that is to test the same measure with the same individuals at multiple points in time. So I could show the same panel of coders, the same images of the same children on Tuesday, and then again on Thursday. Uh, I, maybe I will shuffle the images so that they don't, you know, just remember what they called each child before. Um, but I, I test the same measure with the same group of individuals at multiple points in time. Another kind of uh, simpler way to uh, measure robustness of a measure is to pilot test. So I could essentially just give the measure to a small test sample before fielding the measure in a larger survey sample. Uh, I could see how well the measure works uh, among a small group before spending a lot of time, effort, and money using a questionably reliable method with many people. 
So when we measure for robustness or assess robustness of a measure, what we're really trying to figure out is whether there's error. Uh, the goodness of a measure or robustness of a measure relates directly to how much error there is. So you can kind of think of error as the, the inverse of reliability. If a measure is high in error, then it's not very reliable. And there are two types of error we want to think about. One is random error, uh, where the measure is good, but um, it's not perfect, and systematic error, which really means that the measure is quite flawed. So if a measure is good, the kind of error we see is more likely to be random. With random error, each individual in the sample is equally likely to be affected by error. So for example, the CES depression scale uh, asks, in the past week, how have you been feeling? Uh, some people are going to be having a really bad week, but some people are going to be having a great week. So due to some circumstances, we may accidentally uh, get some error, but that error is likely to be random. Uh, somebody's grandmother just died, but somebody just got a new puppy. So, like, yes, there's some error, but it's not affecting one group more than another. Systematic error does affect one group more than another. Systematic error is an indication that the measure is flawed in a way that causes certain types of individuals to be affected by error. An example of this is from the SAT. Um, the SAT used to include a lot of really biased math questions. Uh, now, how could a math question be biased? Math is the same for everybody, right? Well, it used to include questions that ask you to do things like uh, estimate the volume of a car's crankcase or estimate the volume of the cylinder in an engine of a vehicle. Well, if you don't drive, or if you don't like mechanics, and you read that question, you may think to yourself, oh no, I don't know anything about car engines, so I can't answer this question. Now, of course, what you're estimating the volume of is irrelevant as long as you have the dimensions of the cylinder you should still be able to estimate volume. Uh, but the way the question is worded just turned some people off. Um, in specifically, it turned women off. Girls tended to do worse on those questions than boys did, even though there was no reason that girls couldn't estimate volume. Uh, they were just being given a question that put them off and made them think they couldn't answer it. Uh, similarly, uh, if you ask about the volume of a cooking pot, people who cook less may do less well. So questions on the SAT were eventually reworded to ask about the volume of cooking pots. Well, in that case, people who don't cook, specifically men and boys, might do less well because they think, oh, well, I don't know anything about cooking. I can't answer this question. Um, so rewording it neutrally by just asking about the volume of a cylinder or just asking about the volume of a, a bucket, for example, um, made the question less biased. So you can think of systematic error as making the measure biased against certain kinds of people. So let's take a moment and check for understanding. What is a compound measure and how does it relate to the concept of internal validity? What are three methods we can use to test the robustness of a measure? And what are the differences between random error and systematic error? Take a moment and try to answer these questions in long form, uh, like you're explaining them to someone else. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the concept of validity. Validity is the question of whether we're measuring what we intend to measure. If reliability is whether our measures are predictable, validity is whether our measures are correct. So when we talk about internal validity, 
which is what we're going to discuss today, we're talking about how accurately a given measure captures an underlying concept. Uh, see Table 5.3 for an explication of different types of validity. Um, we're going to be talking about face validity, criterion-related validity, including concurrent and predictive validity, content validity, and construct validity. Today we're not going to be talking about the concept of external validity, which is the degree to which the results of a study can be generalized beyond the study. That's something we'll talk about later in the semester, but not today. So the first type of internal validity we're going to talk about is face validity. Face validity just means, does the measure make sense on its face? Does it look right? Uh, most basic, it is the most basic and standard type of validity. It is the most basic standard of validity, and it's rarely sufficient to establish validity on its own. So what I mean by this is an example of face validity would be, do you feel depressed as a measure of depression? It has face validity. Asking someone if they feel depressed makes sense as a way of measuring whether they are depressed. Um, but sometimes it's misleading. So, for example, do you feel anxious has face validity as a measure of anxiety. However, anxious can also mean eager or excited, not just nervous and uncomfortable. So, if we ask, um, if we ask a person, do you feel anxious, it might not measure anxiety in the way we think. It might actually measure excitement or eagerness. This is based on a real example of doing research that I encountered. I asked a person about feeling anxious about their neighborhood, and they said, oh yes, I feel very anxious about my neighborhood. And I said, okay, I thought you liked your neighborhood. And they said, oh yes, I like it so much that I'm super excited to get home at the end of the day. I feel very anxious to get back to my neighborhood when I'm away from it. So I thought I was measuring anxiety, but in fact I was measuring this person's excitement. So face validity here is necessary, but not sufficient. Most of the time when we talk about internal validity, we're talking about criterion-related validity. Criterion-related validity can be conceptualized as concurrent validity or predictive validity. These are both things we can measure. Concurrent validity is the extent to which the new measure correlates with an existing measure of the same concept that we already know is a good measure. An example would be if a new measure of depression is strongly correlated with the Center for Epidemiologic Studies depression scale, then that new measure would have high concurrent validity. The reason is that we already know that the CES depression scale is a really good measure of depression. It has strong validity. So if another measure of depression correlates strongly with that measure, we have a good reason to think that it's a good measure of depression. Another type of criterion-related validity is predictive validity. Here, the new measure should correlate strongly with another measure which it ought to predict. So if a measure of vote, confidence in the voting process is good, then it should strongly predict voting behavior. If we, if we try to measure someone's confidence in the voting process, and we realize that our measure is strongly correlated with that person's actual voting behavior, we might conclude reasonably that we have a good measure of confidence in the voting process, since people who are more confident in the process ought to be more likely to vote. Next, we're going to talk about, in, about content validity. Content validity is a more complicated concept, and so I've drawn this kind of um, overwhelming looking infographic. But if you can imagine with me, the black circle underneath is the construct or concept. It's the underlying idea that we're trying to measure. The big transparent circles on top are dimensions of that concept. And then the little circles 
underneath are the measures. So if we, this is describing a composite measure and the content, the concept of content validity is how fully a composite measure covers all the dimensions of the underlying concept. So if you consider this infographic and you think that each little circle underneath in the different colors is an item on a scale. We're trying to use these items to measure all the different dimensions of the concept. So it's really a measure of coverage. Content validity is really a measure of coverage. How well do the items in a scale cover all the different dimensions of the underlying concept? Now, there are statistics we can use to test for this, but for now, I don't really want you to worry about it. Uh, for now, I just want you to have this idea in your head that what we're measuring is how well the items on a scale or the individual measures in a composite measure cover all the different dimensions of an underlying concept. So if we go back to my example of happiness, and we consider that the black circle underneath represents happiness. We might think that happiness has a lot of different parts to it, a lot of different dimensions. Uh, one dimension could be subjective well-being. Maybe that's represented by the pink circle. Subjective well-being is how well you think your life is going overall. So we could ask three different questions represented by the little pink circles about subjective well-being. We could ask, overall, how well do you feel your life is going? We could also ask, uh, how happy do you feel most of the time? We could also ask, um, do you feel that you're better off than you were before? Maybe those are all measures of subjective well-being, which is a dimension of the concept of happiness. Another subject or another dimension of the concept of happiness might be um, success at work. Maybe people who are more successful at work are much happier. So all those little purple circles could be different items measuring someone's success or contentment at work. So how much do you look forward to going to work? How much do you get along with your coworkers? How much do you feel your work is meaningful? How much do you like your job more than other jobs you've had before? And maybe this little blue circle here is the dimension of happiness in your family. And maybe the white circle is the dimension of um, happiness in your friendships. And all the little circles underneath are items that measure those dimensions. So what we're trying to assess with content validity is how fully we've captured each of the dimensions of the underlying concept. So finally, we want to think about construct validity. Construct validity is a difficult concept to grasp and also very difficult to illustrate. But essentially, it's how strongly the items in a compound measure correlate with an underlying construct which cannot be directly observed. So we, we may think that we can directly observe things like physical attractiveness, but we can't directly observe things like being a good citizen. Um, when, we want, when we say we want to measure being a good citizen, what we can actually measure are kind of symptoms of being a good citizen or indicators of being a good citizen. So when we think of someone who's a good citizen, we might think of things we could point to that that person does that we think makes them a good citizen. But we can't just size somebody up and go, ah, yeah, she's a good citizen. We can just kind of point to good citizen-y things that that person does, like obeying laws, perhaps, or voting, or volunteering, or filling out the census, or wearing a mask during a pandemic. We might think that all those things are characteristic of being a good citizen, 
but it's really hard to directly measure the concept of good citizenship. So when we assess construct validity, what we're really assessing is how well each of those items correlates with being a good citizen. So we're assessing each of the items in the composite measure to say, does each item correlate with the underlying concept of being a good citizen? We're not interested here in coverage as with content validity. We're not interested in whether we have enough measures to fully get at what it means to be a good citizen. We're interested in each individual item and how strongly it correlates with our idea of being a good citizen. For example, maybe we think that it's absolutely essential that a good citizen obeys the laws. Maybe we think it's absolutely essential to be a good citizen that one volunteers. But maybe we're a little iffier on the census. Maybe we think you could be a good citizen and fail to fill out your census. If you're a sociologist, I don't see how you could feel that way. But perhaps, perhaps we think that you could be a good citizen without filling out the census. So maybe that item doesn't really correlate with our concept of being a good citizen as strongly as the others, like obeying laws, voting, volunteering, and wearing a mask during a pandemic. Um, so there are ways to measure construct validity that you'll learn more about in statistics. But for now, just have the concept in your mind. Content validity and construct validity are possible to assess, and you should understand that, but we're not going to learn how to assess them right now. I want to take this moment to say that your book also discusses statistical validity, and we're not going to talk about that right now because we don't really have the tools to discuss that. So I'd like you to kind of gloss over that idea. It won't be on the test uh, because I don't feel that we're prepared to talk about it. So go ahead and check for understanding by practicing answering the following questions. What is the difference between internal and external validity? Why is face validity considered a minimum standard for a valid measure? What are the two types of criterion related validity and how do they differ from one another? And what is the difference between content validity and construct validity? Okay. That's what I want to tell you about reliability and validity. So looking forward, I want us to think about lab exercise two, which is due next week, exam one, and getting caught up if you've fallen behind. So for lab exercise two, it's going to be necessary to read chapter six before you attempt the lab exercise. Um, this is not a specific question in lab exercise two, but it will be really useful for you to think about your unit of analysis. Remember that unit of analysis is uh, what kind of thing is it that you're measuring. So if you want to do a study on education, you might think of that in terms of how good is a school. You might think about it in terms of how good is a school district. You might think about it in terms of how good is education on average in a state? So what's your unit of analysis there? Is it states? Is it school districts? Is it schools? Is it students? Think about what kind of thing it is you're measuring and you'll have a much better time thinking about how to construct a sample. If you're measuring students, for example, it won't work to have a list of schools as a sampling frame you'll need to have a list of all the students in all the schools. Um, it's also important to turn your assignment in on time. This is not just for my convenience. It, it's also so you can get timely feedback. These lab exercises build on each other quickly, and it's important that you get feedback on one before beginning another. And please let me know right away if you need help with this lab assignment. Uh, I expect that by the time you watch this video, I will have gotten feedback on your first lab exercise back to you. Um, if you understand already that you're kind of lost in the lab assignments, please get in touch with me right away and let me know. 
I will try my best to help you. Um, finally, thinking about exam one, which is in two weeks, uh, I will post a review sheet for the exam by the end of this week. Um, the review sheet will just be a list of kind of topics and broad discussion questions. The exam will be multiple choice and short answer questions. So I'm not giving you a practice test. I'm just giving you a list of concepts and questions to review that I think will help you do better on the exam. Um, I will conduct a review session the Tuesday before the exam. Uh, which will be synchronous, meaning I'll schedule a Teams meeting that everyone can sign into at the same time, but it will also be optional. So it will be like our lab meetings. I won't grade you on whether or not you attend, but it also won't be a video. It will just be a synchronous lab meeting style meeting. Uh, you're welcome to join, but you don't have to. If you prefer to study by yourself, that's okay. Uh, I want to encourage you to form virtual study groups using either Teams or GroupMe or something else. Um, you could even use Google Docs and fill out the review sheet together as a group. Uh, I want to encourage you to go to tutoring uh, through the Academic Resource Center if you think that will help you prepare for the exam. And I want you to ask me if you need help. If you are going through the review sheet and you realize there's a concept that you just can't understand, even after reviewing the videos and reviewing the textbook, please get in touch with me and let me try again to explain it to you. I'm here to help you and I'm happy to do my best. Uh, I look forward to hearing from each of you in the coming days and weeks. I think that uh, if you haven't taken time to meet with me about your research yet, it would be really helpful for you to do so. Uh, especially after I get your first lab assignment back to you. I think you'd find it really helpful to talk to me about how it went, especially if you're not happy with your grade. That's all I really have to say to you this week. Um, please feel free to join our lab meeting on Wednesday uh, and participate in the discussion forums on Tuesday and Thursday. Thank you very much and have a wonderful week.